Thanks for joining us. This is Notepad with me, Ibrahim Sani. As we continue on our conversation on what works and what doesn't work in corporate Malaysia, we also have to take into consideration some of the elements regarding the general or wider element of economic environment. Very recently, the EU ASEAN Business Council has published its latest survey on European businesses doing uh, its business here in this part of the world. And the uh, report is called uh, the 8th Business uh, Sentiment Survey, an annual publication reporting on European businesses operating within ASEAN's corporate environment. Some of the ideas that we can share with you from the top line findings include the European businesses do see ASEAN as a great opportunity for economic integration and economic um, uh, uh, advantages, but needs to accelerate work on elimination of barriers to trade. So here to share with us uh, on this and many more is uh, Chris Humphrey, the Executive Director of EU ASEAN Business Council or EU ABC. Chris, thanks for joining us. Let's uh, run through some of the key uh, findings of the 8th uh, Business uh, 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 Sentiment Survey. Thanks, Ibrahim, for having me on. Yes, the survey shows an overwhelmingly positive picture for ASEAN going forward. It's seen as the region of best economic opportunity and in fact, the gap between ASEAN and the next best one, which is China, has widened this year, uh, probably driven by China's zero COVID policies. Um, our companies who we surveyed are expecting increases in profit. They're expecting to expand their business operations in Southeast Asia. Uh, Malaysia comes out pretty well on that metric as well, but it does have a series of concerns. Those concerns relate largely around uh, ASEAN regional economic integration, not being fast enough, not being deep enough uh, towards Europe, a plea to speed up doing trade deals with the region, and then some concerns around sustainability and green economy issues. What I do find interesting is that 63% um, of respondents do see ASEAN as the region with the best economic opportunity, consistent from last year, 63%. Uh, and more than two-thirds or 69% of respondents do expect to see the ASEAN markets to be a more important item uh, in terms of worldwide revenues over the next two years. So this is basically underlining the fact that ASEAN is a key factor to move forward. There are some issues, not just related to, say, barriers to trade, but other risks as well, including that of political risk. Where do you see the opportunities lie in terms of the challenges that we need to navigate in, uh, to make these kind of numbers work for us? It's a good question. I think you know the reason why ASEAN is seen so positively is quite clear. The underlying fundamentals of the region remain there. We have good growth, higher growth than we see in anywhere else in the world. A European would wipe their hand off for the sort of growth that we're seeing in Southeast Asia, including in Malaysia as well. Young population, world's third largest workforce, growing urbanization, growing middle classes. So all those positives are there. The risks, I think, do come from perhaps not moving fast enough and trying to open up markets. As the rest of the world is beginning to close up, we've got concerns over Russia, Ukraine, we've got concerns over South China Sea and Taiwan. Um, there's the spectre of COVID or another pandemic always hovering in the background. So I think the region now really has to say, this is the time. This is the window of opportunity for us. What can we do to make sure the FDI keeps flowing into the region? What can we do to make sure businesses want to keep growing in the region? And that's also really just pushing forward on integration. Also important to note is that, um, uh, uh, so I'm going to be uh, 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 taking this slow uh, to, to give context to uh, our friends watching us right now. 81% of respondents believe that non-tariff barriers to trade in ASEAN are not decreasing. 81% seems a lot, but in 2021, the number was 97%. So it seems like there's, there's this sentiment that's going on that non-tariff barriers to trade, while there, it has been decreasing. Another item that we can talk about is 23% believe that non-tariff barriers in tr to trade in ASEAN are increasing. Again, it may seem like one in four, but the number was actually quite high at 38% uh, in 2021. So do you believe that the sentiment, while a bit negative in terms of barriers to trade in ASEAN continue, uh, uh, plans to continue on, generally speaking, that kind of sentiment is decreasing over time? If you look at the, the numbers at face value between this year and last year, that's a conclusion you could probably draw. But I think that the truth is, when you look at the numbers a bit more closely, the numbers who say they're remaining the same as opposed to decreasing yep. is pretty flat. And yep. that's, I think that's the key, the key measure. And the, and the truth is, whilst the region collectively has some great ideas about how to tackle non-tariff barriers, 
collectively they're not doing so. Some countries do better than others. Um, Malaysia, I think, is slightly better than others. There are other partners you have in the region who really are dragging their feet on this issue. This issue. Okay. One more item that we need to talk about is um, how do we move forward from this? Uh, in the survey, it argues that 73% uh, of respondents believe that EU should pursue region-to-region -region FTA or free trade agreement with ASEAN now. This number is up from 49% or 50%. So basically, previously, one in two perhaps would I like to argue that a uh, 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 region-to-region FTA is important. Now, it's actually three in four. So do you think that this is a reality that is brewing uh, right now, that perhaps we should really pursue region-to-region -region FTA? I think that increase is driven largely by seeing ASEAN doing a lot more on its own trade deals, and particularly with the signing and the soon implementation of RCEP right across the region. European industry, I think, is saying, we're feeling a bit left out of this. We're feeling a very disadvantage. That, that, that sentiment comes out in the survey as well. I think the truth is a region-to-region -region FTA between the EU and ASEAN as a collective is going to be incredibly hard to pull off. And I think the, there's an ambition disconnect between the two sides. EU wants something really way up here, and ASEAN is looking for something much further down here, much more simpler trade deal. And bridging that gap is going to prove very problematic. So in the meantime, I think we're looking at a series of further bilateral deals, Indonesia first, and we hope EU and Malaysia in the not-too-distant future. All right, EU to Malaysia is actually quite an item that we need to talk about further. But for now, we'll go for one short break. When we come back, we'll continue on our conversation with the EU ASEAN Business Council. Thanks for staying on with us. I have with me uh, Chris Humphrey, the Executive Director of EU ASEAN Business Council or EU ABC. Chris, we really need to talk about one item that is quite interesting, which is of course sustainability. Uh, this year, the report includes uh, topics on sustainability. This is of course, I'd like to make a case by the way, that ASEAN and sustainability is something not much of a forefront of an item. If it is, I'll be very surprised on how it is. Uh, but generally speaking, sustainability is a big topic for the EU to talk about for their partners. Very recently, I spoke with the EU Commissioner on Environment and he was arguing that the very reason why he's making his tour around uh, this region is because he wants to impress upon his partners here in this part of the world that sustainability remains to be a key focus and a key element for us to talk about when it comes to business development. Now, do you feel that Malaysia and ASEAN for that matter has the kind of feel or love for sustainability the way the EU folks has? I think that depends on how you define sustainability. Uh, in the European context, sustainability means the environment and the environment and the environment. Here in Southeast Asia, we, we tend to think of it as a much broader thing and look at all of the UN SDGs when we're talking about it. So feeding yourself, access to decent job, access to healthcare, access to education are probably the preeminent feelings. You can't ignore the environment, and, and you've seen it recently with increased storms in the Philippines and elsewhere in the region. Uh, climate change is there. It is happening. So we have to start dealing with that whilst also meeting all the other sustainability goals at the same time. And the two aren't mutually exclusive. We can help green the economies, help tackle climate action whilst creating growth and creating jobs and feeding people and improving our general lives as well at the same time. The two can happen together. You, you know, I'd like to make an, a case that some corporates, especially the big ones, not just here in Malaysia but in ASEAN, has been taking on uh, sustainability at a much more uh, vigorous approach, uh, be largely because uh, it is much more profitable to do so. Um, and uh, I've spoken to enough C-suites inside Malaysia to uh, argue that um, it makes much more business sense to go for greener options for whatever they do, in, in, uh, irrespective of the sector that they're in. However, on a government-to-government -government level, many governments inside Southeast Asia are still trying to grasp on the issue of making things a little bit better for businesses to approach green and sustainable businesses. This includes greater tariff uh, um, uh, reduction, um, greater tax breaks and so on, whatever the incentives may be. But the reaction from governments may not necessarily be forthcoming or quick enough for corporates to adopt. Do you feel this is the case uh, right now? And perhaps how does the EU ABC plan to address this particular challenge? 
uh, yeah, actually, I tend to agree with you on, on all of what you just said. When we looked at our survey, and I looked at Malaysia in particular, we asked, you know, is Malaysia's sustainability goals good enough? And only 40% of respondents said yes. And only 45% thought that Malaysia was serious about achieving sustainability goals. I think there is absolutely a case. This needs to be corporate-led. The corporates are leading the charge, no matter whether they're European or American or, or Southeast Asian corporates. And that's largely because their consumer base, their customers are telling them to do so, and their shareholders and their investors are telling them to do so as well. And, that, and that's, that's the real driver for them going forward. But we all need to do this together, and we need governments to work on it. If you're talking about greening the energy supply, going towards more renewables, governments need to put in place the right regulatory framework to support that and make sure that the work's been done behind the scenes on the national grids to support that as well. Equally, the corporates and company finance. Now, us as a business council, we're doing a lot of work about trying to advance sustainable finance in the region, create the right ecosystem to support it so that in the region, we can do more on green projects, on energy transition, on climate action, etc. Uh, Chris, one more item that we uh, must uh, touch uh, is on the issue of how uh, the government is doing things. Uh, largely, we know in a democracy, governments tend to be more reactive rather than proactive. Some governments are rather proactive. But the reactivity does stem from what the people want. Now, if the people want the government to do a particular thing, the government generally would respond in kind, largely because that is what keeps them in power. However, I don't have that feel that the general public here in the folks of ASEAN want their government to do more on sustainability. I may be wrong, but this is a pedestrian way of uh, looking at things, I suppose. Because of this being the case, and as, or assuming that this is the case, how then do you think the political will is going to affect government taking on sustainability at a more vigorous approach? I think this means we need a lot more work on uh, public-private partnership on this. Mm. Corporates, as I said earlier, need to be taking more of a lead. Uh, but we all need to demonstrate to the general public the importance of doing things to tackle climate change, of helping to green our supply chains. Uh, the truth of the fact is, if countries don't move fast enough on greening their supply chains, businesses won't be able to invest in them going forward because their investors, their shareholders and their consumers won't let them. And possibly their domestic regulator won't let them as well. So there's a lot more we need to do on this. And I think we need to educate the general public. But the key thing is to show that greening the economies and doing sustainability initiatives on the environment are not mutually exclusive from doing things to improve your lives and your livelihood and your own economic development and your jobs and you know access to food and access to, to decent living. These things can be done together. And I think we just all need to prove they can be done together. We all know that governments in the region maybe have a shortage of money to invest in these things. And again, that's where the private sector plays a big part. The big asset managers out there, the big pension funds, they got money, they want to invest it. They just need to find the right projects to invest it. Uh, being a very capitalistic um, uh, a person that I am, I do feel also that corporates are much more effective and much more efficient in terms of rolling up projects, rather, uh, whether it's big or small. Uh, my colleague, uh, Sharad, likes to argue otherwise. He's saying that uh, governments have the machinery and have the clout to actually make it much more lasting effect in what, on whatever they do. But do you feel that uh, when it comes to capitalism, there is a better option to do this, i.e. corporates continue to lead and perhaps government has a light touch on it or to rather be crude about it, to stay out of the way when corporates do their work? I think you need both sides of that equation to be involved. You need governments to be setting the regulatory frameworks or at least creating the enabling ecosystem to support lots of this stuff. Um, so businesses can come along and say, we want to invest in renewable energies. We want to build wind farms and solar farms. And they can probably do it a lot quicker than a government controlled entity could do it because they're more yeah. foot, they're more commercially aware. Um, they probably can get staffing quicker to do it. But you still need the government to support that behind the scenes either by having the right leading tariffs or making sure the national grid is set up for it properly or providing guarantees over the land usage or future legislation, then business can step in and really drive these things forward. Okay, uh, we need to talk about the ASEAN economic integration, but we'll go for one short break. When we come back, we'll discuss a little bit more with Chris Humphrey of the EU ASEAN Business Council.
Thanks for staying on with us. I have with me on the line, joining us virtually, Chris Humphrey, the Executive Director of the EU ASEAN Business Council. Uh, Chris, let's talk about the ASEAN Economic Integration. It is an initiative to bring about economic integration across the various markets uh, in Southeast Asia to talk about development strategy amongst our partner member countries. And of course, we need to understand a bit better about how this is going about in its effectiveness. What is the EU ABC's view on the ASEAN Economic Integration? Uh, it's going too slow. It's not deep enough. It's not fast enough. Um, the region is missing a great opportunity to do a lot more together and make themselves even more attractive than they already are. I can't be much more blunt than that. Yeah, I like, I like how you don't miss your words, uh, Chris. I really like it because it is what it is. You call it for what it is, right? Well, I, I don't miss my words at ASEAN meetings. I don't quite see why I should do so here. I mean, great work has been done on tariff elimination across the region. It's fantastic. But it doesn't stop at tariff elimination. You've got to do more on harmonizing standards across the region. At the moment, if you're exporting a car park from Malaysia to Indonesia, it's a whole different set of requirements going into Indonesia. And, and that's just crazy. If you want it to be one production base, which was the ultimate original goal, there shouldn't be different standards. And then you still have things like quota requirements on coffee or, or dairy products going into Thailand. It's just two examples of non-tariff barriers that exist. Within ASEAN, those, those barriers shouldn't be there. As a region, done a fantastic job with external partners. Just look at RCEP, look at CPTPP, look at all the ASEAN plus one, um, ASEAN plus one FTAs. But within themselves, they sort of started off running extremely hard and fast, tackled the easy stuff, but now we're in the difficult stuff and it seems to be stalling. Do you feel that because of the rising political risk or the ongoing, you know, say, for instance, general elections here in Malaysia, it's just going to have a you know, rather pessimistic outlook in terms of getting this done? Where do you feel we need to plug in the gaps to actually overcome these kind of challenges? It'll take a lot of political will. Um, yes, every country in the region has different election cycles or different domestic pressure groups operating. There is a sense for some of them, and it's a great deal of protectionism going on. We have significant local content requirements in Indonesia, a lot of non-tariff barriers emanating out from Thailand. I should say at this point, I think Malaysia is one of the better players at this game in the region, and one of the countries which really does push harder for um, economic integration within ASEAN. I think you've had successive politicians there who've seen the value that being as a bigger united grouping can bring to, to Malaysia and to the broader region. The problem is you need to have politicians who have the longer vision, who can see the ultimate benefit, not only to their own economies, but also to the broader region. Um, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about a partner that is neither ASEAN nor the EU, which is the United Kingdom. Very recently, we saw the, e, uh, e, sorry, the uh, UK government uh, sliding into uh, recession. Uh, do you feel that the UK government has a, a role to play or the UK economy has a role to play in terms of building a relationship between, say, EU and ASEAN? Just uh, trying out my luck here uh, when it comes to uh, the UK. Uh, I think the UK has got a lot of domestic issues to sort out for themselves. But, you know, if the UK government wants Brexit to be a success, they need to be forging more trade deals around the world. And I think Southeast Asia is a natural place for them to come. In the same way that for the EU, Southeast Asia is a natural place to come. You've got uh, a region which re uh, believes in a global-based, rules-based system. Um, both the UK and the EU believe in that as well. You've got partners here who have a long-standing relationship with you, both the UK and the EU. So there's a lot of reasons why the UK should be paying more attention to Southeast Asia, and I think you will see them doing so. Once the, this new government under Liz Trust settles down and the new team in international trade set in position, I think you'll see them having a lot more interaction with Southeast Asia. Uh, let's do a quick recap. Moving forward, what would you like to see being done uh, to enhance cooperation between the business ties of EU and ASEAN? I know we've spoken at length, but perhaps some of the two or three ideas that uh, some of the viewers can actually walk away with. Uh, I would like to see ASEAN and regional economic integration drive forward harder and faster, particularly on non-tariff barriers. We would like to see the EU and ASEAN ramp up their trade deals at the moment, I would say 
the EU needs to recommence deals with Malaysia, Thailand and the Philippines, as well as get the deal with Indonesia over the line. And then I think all of us need to work harder on greening supply chains and looking after sustainability, but sustainability in its broadest sense. We need to make sure no one's left behind. People have jobs, they have access to healthcare, education, uh, clean water, etc., as well as looking after the environment. Fantastic. Before we end, I'd like to talk a little bit about your organization, the EU ASEAN Business Council. Who are your members? How long have you been here? And perhaps some of the ideas on perhaps some partners who want to collaborate with EU ABC. So the council's been around for, for eight years now, uh, formally. Our members are all nine of the European Chambers of Commerce in Southeast Asia and almost 50 of the largest European multinational corporates. So we truly do represent all of European industry right across Southeast Asia. We do a lot of work with, with other business councils in the region, including the ASEAN Business Advisory Council, and particularly the branch we have there in Malaysia as well, um, as well as the US and the UK and the New Zealand and the Australians and the other business councils. Um, and we also then do a lot of work back in Europe. We are pushing the European Commission hard, as well as advocating for our, our members' interests here in Southeast Asia. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris. I'd like to meet you in person uh, down the road. But for now, that was our conversation with Chris Humphrey, the Executive Director of the EU ASEAN Business Council. They published plenty of reports. Perhaps uh, it's a good idea to go through them uh, if you have the time. And of course, uh, perhaps seek out to reach and reach out to them if you want to seek some business opportunities uh, between the businesses, not just in ASEAN uh, and EU, but of course, uh, some of the business partners that they have across the world as well. Until then, thanks very much for watching. My name is Ibrahim Sani. Catch you in the next one.